For many years, hypersonic weapons have been an immensely promising form of military technology, holding the potential to revolutionize numerous domains of warfare. Their ability to strike targets at ranges as distant as 1,200 nautical miles in 25 minutes would provide warfighters with a level of responsiveness that has never been witnessed in the history of combat. Time-critical targets could effectively be engaged over a very wide area, and the speed at which these weapons travel will impose serious complications on command and control processes and infrastructure. By compressing the time the enemy has to respond, you compromise their ability to react. In addition to their much greater ability to maneuver and change flight profile, make them far more able to penetrate the kind of layered ballistic missile defense systems developed by the United States. The future tactical, operational and strategic implications this technology promises has generated a large amount of interest, not only in the dedicated strategic community, but also in the general media, such as publications like Popular Mechanics. In fact, there have been calls for the United States to reconsider its investment in aircraft carriers because of this technology, based on claims that hypersonic anti-ship missiles are essentially unstoppable. We must remember, however, that overestimating the potential of a technology is often just as bad as underestimating it, and much of the analysis conducted on hypersonic weapons ignores both their actual limitations and the substantial engineering challenges that remain unsolved. To understand the likely effect of hypersonic weapons on naval warfare in the near term, we first need to understand what this technology is, what its limitations are, and its level of maturity. In order to do that, we need to get a little technical. So what is a hypersonic vehicle? The term hypersonic means traveling at speeds in excess of Mach 5 or five times the speed of sound. The actual velocity of this threshold changes with air density as the speed of sound is variant with altitude. Generally, hypersonic vehicles travel between Mach 5 and Mach 25, depending on their flight profile and altitude. Although only reaching the low end of the hypersonic regime, research into hypersonic flight dates back to the mid 20th century. The legendary X-15 was the first true hypersonic manned aircraft. Powered by a liquid-fueled rocket engine, the X-15 was lifted to its launch altitude by a B-52 Stratofortress where, after release from the mothership, the aircraft would climb to altitudes in excess of 100,000 feet. In October 1967, the X-15 reached a speed of 7,241 km per hour, Mark 6.7, at an altitude of 102,000 feet a world record for a crewed aircraft that stands to this day. Hypersonic weapons were also first realized in the early 20th century. Technically, most ballistic missiles are hypersonic weapons, as the re-entry vehicles enter the atmosphere at speeds well in excess of Mark V. In 1980, the Soviet Union fielded the world's first hypersonic cruise missile, the KH-15. NATO codename AS-16 Kickback this solid rocket-fueled anti-ship missile is reportedly capable of reaching speeds of Mark V in its boost phase. Although technically speaking hypersonic vehicles, these 20th century examples are not really comparable to the types of hypersonic weapons that are currently under development, given their relatively low speed or ballistic trajectory. Hypersonic flight poses some substantial technical challenges, including material science and aircraft design. During supersonic flight, air compressibility is the primary challenge. However, as the airspeed increases above Mach 5, the problem becomes heat. As the vehicle reaches hypersonic velocities, it imparts an enormous amount of energy to the air around it, drastically increasing its temperature. This temperature, referred to as the stagnation temperature or the temperature at the area of maximum heat transfer, increases fourfold for every doubling of the Mach number. Traveling at a speed of Mach 7 at 80,000 feet, essentially all of the aircraft will encounter temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius. At Mach 8, the inlet ducts will be at 2,300 degrees. The fact that these temperatures need to be sustained for tens of minutes, far more than the space shuttle, poses substantial thermal challenges, not only for the skin of the aircraft and airframe, but also its internal systems. Additionally, this heat stress tends to be focused on specific areas of the aircraft, such as the leading edges, presenting complications for airframe design. Currently, there are three types of hypersonic systems under development. The hypersonic glide vehicle, the hypersonic cruise missile, and hypersonic artillery. 
The hypersonic glide vehicle, or HGV, is perhaps the most advanced form of modern hypersonic weapon, with operational or near operational programs in Russia, China, and the United States. The best way to think of a HGV is, essentially, a replacement for the ballistic missile reentry vehicle. Typical ballistic missiles take small warheads, called reentry vehicles, and throw them into high ballistic trajectories that take them well beyond the Earth's atmosphere. For a large, long-range ballistic missile in the ICBM class, the apogee, or highest point of the flight path, may be as high as 1,200 kilometers, well above the satellites in low Earth orbit. Although re-entry vehicles achieve speeds at the very high end of the hypersonic range, they can be rapidly detected by terrestrial and space-based sensors and, generally speaking, have a very limited ability to maneuver. This allows the targeted force to rapidly understand exactly what is being targeted and provides opportunity for exo-atmospheric engagement by mid-course interceptors, such as the standard missile 3. The HGV replaces the traditional ballistic missile re-entry vehicle with a hypersonic aircraft that glides along the very top of the atmosphere at an altitude of around 100 kilometers or 300,000 feet. They are thus exo-atmospheric weapons which generally operate outside of the atmosphere. These vehicles are designed to produce just enough lift to maintain this altitude and glide to their target. They quite literally skip across the top of the atmosphere. As the air is so thin at these altitudes, HGVs are capable of sustaining speeds in excess of Mach 10. Because the HGV is not powered, or at best may have a very small engine designed to extend its range, it needs to be boosted to a semi-ballistic trajectory to get the vehicle outside of the atmosphere, typically requiring a ballistic missile. Once the HGV has reached an altitude of a few hundred kilometers, it descends to its cruise altitude and proceeds to its target. As the aircraft is interacting with the atmosphere, this gives it a much greater ability to maneuver than a typical re-entry vehicle, much more akin to a plane than a ballistic missile. When the HGV reaches its target, it simply conducts a hypersonic dive. One of the primary catalysts for the development of hypersonic glide vehicle technology in Russia, and later China, is the increasing sophistication of the United States ballistic missile defense system. The US now fields a multi-tiered BMD system which combines mid-course interceptors, such as the SM-3, which can engage targets at an altitude of 1,000 kilometers, with terminal defense systems including THAAD and the Patriot Advanced Capability 3. In combination, these weapons have multiple chances to intercept ballistic missiles during their ballistic and re-entry phases. This BMD system has substantially degraded the effectiveness of both Russia and China's ballistic missile capability, creating anxiety around the credibility of their nuclear deterrent. Hypersonic glide vehicles are far more difficult for BMD systems to engage. Although they don't travel any faster than typical re-entry vehicles, they fly at a much lower altitude which substantially reduces the radar horizon. For example, at a peak altitude of 1,000 kilometers, a defensive radar system will be able to track a re-entry vehicle at a range of around 4,000 kilometers. In comparison, cruising at an altitude of 300,000 feet, the HGV will only be above the radar horizon at 1,300 kilometers. Traveling at Mach 10, almost three kilometers per second, the defensive system will only have some seven minutes to react. Additionally, HGVs are much more difficult to detect by the United States' early warning satellite network the defensive system has to detect the incoming missile, generate a track, classify the weapon, and engage it. This process is called the OODA loop, meaning observe, orient, decide, act, and each step in this process takes time. This compression of time is one of the greatest advantages hypersonic weapons provide, as it puts substantial stress on command and control systems, degrading their defensive potential. The second major complication is the cruising altitude of HGVs and their ability to maneuver. At 100 km altitude, they fly below the effective engagement envelope of mid-course interceptors like the SM-3. Additionally, given their ability to both glide and maneuver, HGVs can use a very unpredictable flight path which substantially complicates the tactical picture for the targeted force. As opposed to a typical ballistic missile, even after detection, it will be very hard to determine the HGV's target, holding an extremely wide area at risk. Although this is less important in naval warfare, where defensive systems are already concentrated, in a strategic strike scenario, the potentially target area could be the size of a continent. This kind of capability would render the United States' wide area ballistic missile defense systems 
such as Aegis Ashore, much less effective, substantially degrading a key element in the BMD complex. Additionally, this ability to manoeuvre will make mid-course interception more difficult, although terminal missile phase such as the THAAD are designed to engage manoeuvring targets and, therefore, would be less degraded. The second major area of hypersonic weapon development is the hypersonic cruise missile. As opposed to the HGV, the hypersonic cruise missile, or HCM, is an endo-atmospheric weapon, meaning its entire flight path takes place within the atmosphere. Hypersonic cruise missiles are under development by several powers, including Russia, India, the United States, and Australia. HCMs are generally tactical weapons, which have a far shorter range than HGVs, but are much lighter, smaller, and more responsive. These systems are designed to be used at the tactical and operational levels of warfare, forming the basis for medium-range strike and anti-ship systems. They are unlikely to be used as nuclear delivery systems, at least in comparison to HGVs. Their intended use is to supplement, or replace, the conventional cruise missile, both in the land and maritime strike roles. HCMs are air-breathing weapons that use oxygen from the atmosphere to burn fuel, just like a typical cruise missile, and fly at both lower altitude and lower speeds than hypersonic glide vehicles. These missiles use a type of engine called a supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet, where the supersonic airstream is funneled to a combustion chamber by the shape of the aircraft. As the supersonic airstream enters the combustion chamber, it is automatically highly compressed, drastically increasing its temperature. Just like an automotive diesel engine, this compressed air is hot enough to begin combustion without ignition, requiring nothing more than the injection of fuel. Therefore, the scramjet has no compressor blades or turbines and is far simpler, and hopefully more reliable, than a typical jet engine. They require a small rocket booster to accelerate them to operational speeds and altitudes, but could be small enough to be launched from a fighter. As hypersonic cruise missiles are air-breathing, they have a limited altitude range at which they can effectively operate. As the air becomes thinner with altitude, the higher they fly, the faster they have to go in order to maintain enough oxygen to sustain combustion. However, at speeds in excess of Mark 10, the heat load becomes impractical, with stagnation temperatures in excess of 4,000 degrees Celsius. Additionally, there is a point at which there simply isn't enough oxygen to sustain combustion, no matter the speed. These factors effectively place an upper altitude limit on HCMs, between 80 and 130,000 feet, depending on velocity. As the air becomes thicker at lower altitudes, the thermal and dynamic pressures are simply too great to allow hypersonic flight. This produces a lower altitude boundary. As the speed drops, so does this boundary, and at typical operating speeds of Mach 8, these systems need to fly above 80,000 feet. Sea skimming hypersonic weapons are not possible given our current understanding of hypersonic flight. Therefore, hypersonic cruise missiles are limited to a well-defined operating corridor. They have to operate at speeds of Mach 6 to Mach 10 and at altitudes between 80 and 130,000 feet. The third major area of hypersonic weapon development is artillery. The United States is currently the closest power to fielding a hypersonic artillery system through the electromagnetic railgun program. An electromagnetic railgun uses electromagnets to propel a projectile to very high velocities, reportedly between Mark 6 and Mark 10 at sea level. The projectile developed for this system is effectively a miniature missile with guidance and maneuver elements. Relying on hit-to-kill technology, the shell tracks and then impacts its target. The hypersonic velocity of the projectile gives it both a very long range and great destructive potential through kinetic energy transfer. Although the Navy is still publicly committed to the program, funding for the railgun project has been curtailed and it seems unlikely that it will be fielded in the near term. The projectile, however, is now being used in conventional artillery. Called the hypervelocity projectile, or gun-launched guided projectile, this shell maintains the guidance and maneuver capability of the railgun projectile, allowing the Mod 45 5-inch naval gun to be used as an effective anti-cruise missile weapon. When fired out of a conventional artillery piece, either the 5-inch or 155mm gun, the projectile reaches speeds between Mark 3 and Mark 5, substantially less than when fired from a railgun, but still very fast. So, given that technological background, what is the likely impact hypersonic weapons will have on naval warfare in the near to medium term? Are they likely to make aircraft carriers obsolete, as has been argued by many, including popular mechanics? 
Does their combination of hypersonic speed and maneuverability make all shipboard defenses, such as the Aegis combat system and the standard missile family, useless? Should the United States immediately halt new aircraft carrier production in the face of this new unstoppable threat? Well, before we jump to such profound conclusions, perhaps we should examine the technology's inherent limitations. The first issue is something called plasma sheathing. When a vehicle travels at high hypersonic velocities, the air around the aircraft undergoes substantial chemical changes. As the air temperatures reach 2200 degrees, the oxygen atoms begin to disassociate and become highly reactive. And above 8700 degrees, the air itself begins to ionize. This process of ionization creates a plasma sheath around the aircraft, which is ionized and therefore electrically conductive. This plasma sheath seriously interferes with any communication with the aircraft, and is the reason spacecraft like the Space Shuttle have a communication blackout during re-entry. Plasma sheathing also prevents the use of onboard electro-optical sensors or radars. This problem is most felt by hypersonic glide vehicles which travel at speeds in excess of Mark 10. What this means in practical terms is not only can the HGV not receive targeting information or mid-course updates while traveling at these speeds, but it cannot access satellite navigation signals. This means that if the HGV wants to maintain hypersonic velocities, it must rely purely on an inertial navigation system. These systems tend to wander over time, which is why they rely on satellite updates to correct for errors which build up, a critical problem for a weapon that travels thousands of kilometers. An inertial navigation system will probably provide enough accuracy for a nuclear weapon, but is unlikely to be sufficient for precision strike. In the words of the RAAF's Air Power Development Center, Limitations in current sensor and guidance systems indicate that, to ensure precision guidance and maneuverability in the terminal guidance phase, hypersonic weapons will need to slow to low supersonic or even subsonic speeds to assure weapon accuracy against static or moving targets. In simple terms, a hypersonic glide vehicle would need to slow to supersonic velocities to both receive navigation and targeting data and use its onboard sensors to acquire its target, which is critical if that target is a ship which is moving. At that point, the vehicle is essentially conducting a supersonic dive like a conventional cruise missile. A very similar story is true for hypersonic cruise missiles. Although the plasma sheathing issue is less critical for HCMs, as their speeds are in the low hypersonic range, they are less likely to encounter ionization issues. They are still limited by dynamic pressures. As discussed earlier, there is a minimum altitude at which hypersonic flight is viable, and ships operate at sea level. Sustained flight above Mark 5 is only possible at 50,000 feet or above, and in the terminal phase of the attack, where the HCM will be within range of the ship's defensive missile systems, it will be flying at speeds lower than Mark 4. To put that into perspective, the 1960s era KH-22, NATO codename AS-4 Kitchen anti-ship cruise missile, had a maximum speed of just over Mark IV. Therefore, in the terminal stage, hypersonic anti-ship missiles will be operating in the speed regime in which the current naval air defenses were designed to be most effective. So what about maneuverability? It is the combination of speed and maneuver which hypersonic advocates argue will render current defenses helpless. Well, again, once we get into the details of the technology, there remain substantial challenges in terms of hypersonic maneuver. In general terms, the laws of physics work to constrain the maneuver performance of a hypersonic vehicle. Material strengths, heating, and the aerodynamics of hypersonic airflow all work to inhibit hypersonic maneuver. Hypersonic glide vehicles can greatly alter their flight path whilst they are at high altitude, although doing so will rapidly decelerate the aircraft. But when operating in the lower parts of the atmosphere, rapid hypersonic maneuver will generate substantial dynamic pressures. Essentially, many analysts have confused the ability of HGVs to conduct mid-course maneuver with their ability to maneuver in the terminal phase. Additionally, designing flight control surfaces that can be effective in subsonic, transonic, supersonic, and hypersonic flight regimes, including ensuring their structural integrity, remains a substantial challenge. Therefore, what we can expect from the first generation of hypersonic anti-ship missiles, either HCVs or HCMs, is a hypersonic high-altitude sprint to the target area, followed by a supersonic or even subsonic in some cases, dive. 
Hypersonic glide vehicles will generally complement anti-ship ballistic missiles and will be launched from land bases, while hypersonic cruise missiles will be more flexible tactical weapons used in a similar fashion to current anti-ship cruise missiles. Although the US AGM-183 Air Launch Rapid Response Weapon appears to be a HGV, which is an air-launched tactical weapon, so there is some crossover. In both cases, the missile will dash to the target, although the HGV will operate at higher speeds and altitudes and then slow down out of the hypersonic regime to acquire their target and enter the lower troposphere. In the terminal phase, where the ship's defensive systems will be engaging these weapons, they will not be hypersonic, but will rather be operating in the same regime as many high-altitude supersonic cruise missiles which are currently operational, such as the AS-4 Kitchen and AS-16 Kickback. Thus, in terms of terminal performance, first-generation hypersonic anti-ship missiles may not offer a marked advantage over sea-skimming supersonic cruise missiles, given their high-altitude profile and supersonic dive. Therefore, the hypersonic weapons we are likely to see fielded over the next 20 years are probably not the Wunderwaffe described by popular mechanics and other writers, a weapon that will magically make the aircraft carrier a floating death trap. Rather, they are more likely to be an evolutionary development of currently deployed weapon systems, at least in terms of naval warfare. There is one area where first-generation hypersonic anti-ship missiles will have a significant advantage over traditional anti-ship cruise missiles, area of uncertainty limitations. The problem with shooting long-range missiles at ships is the fact that they move. Let's imagine we want to shoot a missile at a ship which is a thousand nautical miles away. As a satellite passes over, we get a brief track of the vessel. We know its location precisely. We launch three missiles, a subsonic missile flying at 500 knots, mark 0.7, a supersonic weapon which flies at 1,000 knots, about Mach 1.5, and a hypersonic glide vehicle that flies at 10,000 knots, Mach 15. After the satellite moves away, we lose our track, and that ship is now moving at 30 knots. What this means is, for every two minutes, that ship has moved a nautical mile, almost two kilometers, and we have no idea what direction it's traveling in. This potential area where the ship could be is called the area of uncertainty. The subsonic weapon, like a Tomahawk cruise missile, will get there in two hours, at which point the area of uncertainty has ballooned out to over 11,000 square nautical miles. The supersonic weapon did much better, getting there in an hour, but the area of uncertainty is still almost 3,000 square nautical miles. Both of these areas are likely to be far greater than the weapon's sense of footprint, meaning, chances are, we miss the ship. If we ignore the boost phase, just to clarify the example, the hypersonic weapon gets there in 6 minutes, so the ship has only travelled 3 nautical miles. By using a hypersonic weapon, we have reduced the area of uncertainty to just 28 square miles, which means that when our weapon gets there, it will definitely acquire its target. This has substantial tactical implications. To account for the area of uncertainty limitations of conventional anti-ship cruise missiles, Persistent targeting data has to be generated. Typically, this is achieved by either a maritime patrol aircraft or a drone shadowing the ship and providing targeting updates to the missile so it can adjust its course. However, said aircraft are very vulnerable to naval fighters. Without this persistent tracking data, land-based anti-ship cruise missiles are rendered ineffective and maritime strike aircraft have to use their own sensors to find the vessels, making them vulnerable to naval defenses, including fighters. This connection of elements is called a kill chain. Because hypersonic weapons can react so rapidly, they essentially eliminate a middle link in the kill chain, the most difficult one to maintain, a sustained track on the vessel. Even fleeting firing solutions will be enough to rapidly launch a volley of hypersonic anti-ship missiles. It is in this area, not the physics bending maneuver or magical plasma stealth properties as argued by popular mechanics, both of which are based on a misunderstanding of the technology, where first-generation hypersonic cruise missiles will provide the greatest advantage over currently fielded anti-ship missiles. History, as is almost always the case, provides us with a cautionary tale which should guide us in this instance, the invention of the torpedo. Although invented in 1866, as the torpedo came of age in the late 19th century, it promised to be a disruptive technology. For the previous 300 years, the only way to defeat a battleship was to pummel it with artillery, usually from another battleship. However, this new weapon could be launched from vessels as small as a speedboat. Striking below the waterline, 
For the first time in modern history, a small vessel could quickly sink the largest battleship in the world. There were no effective defences to this new and terrifying weapon, especially when paired with the submarine. These advantages led many to argue that the battleship was now made obsolete by the torpedo, even proposing that a large number of smaller vessels should replace the main battle line. However, we now know the history. Although the torpedo became, and still is, a key component of naval warfare, and it led to the development of new vessels such as the destroyer, it did not make the battleship obsolete. Defensive measures were developed, as were new force structures and doctrinal concepts, and the torpedo simply became another weapon in the arsenal of all naval powers. Further along in this vein, people often take the wrong lesson from the eventual replacement of the battleship by the aircraft carrier. It was not the battleship's vulnerability to air attack which made them obsolete. Indeed, their combination of armor, torpedo defenses, and massive anti-aircraft armament made them some of the most survivable elements of the fleet, especially when provided fighter cover. They were certainly more survivable than cruisers or destroyers. What made the battleship obsolete was the fact that the aircraft carrier simply did the battleship's job, producing destructive effects on their target and sinking ships at long range, but also did it better. Thus, we should probably be skeptical of prognostications proclaiming the demise of the aircraft carrier. What we may end up with is, rather, a more typical offense-defense contest. As the analysis conducted in this video has shown, Many people may be overestimating the impact that first-generation hypersonic weapons will have on naval warfare. This is often the case with the introduction of a new technology that promises to have disruptive effects. Arguably, hypersonic systems will be more useful in the area of conventional strike, rather than anti-shipping, where their speed promises to have a much greater impact on command and control. On land, defensive assets are dispersed, so the combination of hypersonic speed and the ability to rapidly alter the flight path poses considerable command and control challenges, potentially rendering much of the US ballistic missile defense system ineffective. However, when engaging naval targets, these effects are much less important, as the number of targets is far fewer, and the defensive systems are already concentrated. The warship itself has formidable missile defenses, so mid-course interception is far less important. In the terminal phase, Hypersonic weapons are unlikely to dramatically outperform conventional supersonic anti-ship missiles, which the current defenses are already optimized to engage. Therefore, we are still likely to see the fielding of supersonic and subsonic cruise missiles well into the future. However, the greatly enhanced responsiveness and much faster transit time of hypersonic anti-ship missiles will have a dramatic effect on naval warfare, making the long-range engagement of warships a much easier task. Therefore, these weapons do hold great potential to have a disruptive effect on the conduct of naval warfare, and hypersonic systems will be a part of the arsenal of all advanced naval powers. However, we will probably see the great flat tops roaming the world's oceans for the foreseeable future. In fact, probably at least till the end of this century.